on this community. Amen. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you that you are doing a work in us to hunger for your own word. As we study Isaiah 21 to 23, the second series of your warning to, East, to Judah, Lord, help us understand what is in your heart, that today we may hear your word for the world. As the world comes to the end, comes to King Jesus' return again. Lord, help us to take these words deep inside our hearts that we may be ready. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. But Isaiah 21 to 23, right, uh, bring us to the second level, right, of the prophetic call. It's the second shofar, second warning to Judah, Israel, and to more nations with this message, right? So far, the words that Isaiah has spoken, right, um, to warn Israel and Judah, I summarize by four points here. Right? The levels that are like this. Huh? We have covered chapter 13 all the way to chapter 20 from last week. Right? And in this first level, Israel being the center, right? The message to the north, to the west, to the east, and to the south of Israel, for Israel. Now, this is the whole purpose of the prophecy, that the, the Lord is speaking to Judah, right, about all these uh, nations around that are... Uh, intimidating and uh, causing Israel to, to doubt whether God can protect them, whether they will be safe, right? And so God spoke about all these nations around Israel. Well, after the first round, the end of the, the first round is that Egypt and Assyria, the superpowers of uh, those days, Isaiah's days, they will be loved by God, accepted by God, and made as God's servants together with Israel. Now, the turnaround for the nations of the world by God is a miracle that this prophecy of warning and judgment, right, uh, brings about. In all the judgment and destruction, God says, I will do a miracle of uh, bringing nations back to myself, especially Israel. Now, God is going to do a second level, second time round, that is 21 to 23. And then next week, we're going to level 3, right? 24 to 27. Now, as we know that, if someone speaks about a certain matter three times, you know, increasing its, its uh, intensity and, and uh, volume, and uh, warning, you know, higher and higher, we know that something uh, need to be changed in us, 
if someone warns us three times, we know that if we don't do anything, it will be too late, right? So we are now looking at the second time, right? So we're going to go back to capture. Now, what is it all about? <clears throat> the message is that the world and everything in it belongs to God the King. Humanity lives in His world and sets up its own kingdoms using freely God's resources with no thanks or acknowledgement. God's kingdom rules entirely differently from the kingdoms of the world. Thus, he has been calling Israel, his people, first and foremost, to know him as king, honor him, and know the promises he has spoken so that his will will be done and his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. God and his word are the hope of the world. Israel is to bring this gospel to the nations as light to the world. Today, as nations that receive the light, like ourselves, we have the same God and blessed with the same relationship God longs for from us together with Israel, while Israel is asleep about her life and mission. How much we are filled with God's light and life exposes if we are also asleep. How desperate are we to be with God for His light and life to be released everywhere around us? This is how we are to carry revival fire every day and everywhere. This week, uh, God brought Alan Mather, witness to us. He lives this wonderful life of revival fire. Search Google or YouTube on it or to this uh, website for God's book through him with prayers to ignite the fire in us. We can read the first chapter free. Try to get it, get the Kindle copy for seven nine nine. Now, as we study the book of Isaiah, right, the whole purpose is that we know the God in the book of Isaiah, and we know and we hear the voice of God so that today we are a people who hold on to God's word and promises and in all our trouble, in all our confusion, in all our up and down, there is only one thing we can do. That is to call God to ask God for help. That's all that there is to be done. And uh, this book uh, by, uh, uh, by Ellen Maher is a wonderful book that we strongly recommend you. Now, the consequences of living without God as king, occupying his center in us, humanity will live as kings and queens of their own lives and reject God the King as the light and unity of life. This is the crime, the crime of treason, the sin against God humanity ignores. Humanity does not know God the judge and his promises to judge in righteousness. He will cast out all that persists to go away from him or stay passively in the kingdoms of this world. Alternatively, God the judge will draw sinners who repent and turn back to God. He will fully pay for their punishment of death with blood 
and shower us with unconditional love. Consequences depend on humanity's free will, free will choices to trust the Creator God's love for all His unfaithful, unrighteous, and ignorant children to restore true life in them. Right? God's love for we know who we are, right? And how weak we are. And yet, God said, you come back to me, I will restore you. Thirdly, consequences of continuous rejection of God faces God using a strong nation to punish rebellious nations with all the horror and cruelty of war among ungodly people and idols. National insecurity and hopelessness in military defenses is one of the consequences, right, of uh, God's punishment, right, on the people and on the idols we worship. Then climate change that becomes hostile with droughts of floods. Then economic downturn, pervasive poverty, and social disorder, and sicknesses and plagues, merciless killing of women and children, destruction of cities, their idols and properties. And after the war, people are taken away to be slaves far away from their own countries. For Judah and Israel, they are spilled out of the promised land and driven from the temple on Mount Zion. With continuous judgment, the future becomes darker, needs deeper, problems more insoluble. The people of God become more worldly, proud, no less and less of God cares less about His promises and the Holy Spirit. Without God in the center to protect and provide, humanity is wide open to forces of Satan to take over their spiritual and body for evil and wicked purposes against each other, right? Nations against nations, kingdom against kingdom. Destruction and rejection leave broken lives everywhere and down the generation, going further and further away from God. Well, that is what is happening in the world we know today, right? And that is uh, facing God's judgment, right? Today, uh, we don't hear a lot about God's judgment. But God's judgment is here and getting worse, right? Despite all the rebellion and devastation, God remembers his covenant with Abraham to restart the world with Israel. His promises to restore to himself a remnant of Israel and the nations will be activated. This is the hope for the nations of the world. This is the only hope for anyone to ask from God if they know and believe what He promised. Now, with this as, a, as the background, right, I leave it for you to read over and pray and uh, for God to give us greater understanding. Now, the second level of prophecy to Judah warns of the darkness from cruelty of war coming to her from the Assyrian Empire. If she continues to turn away from trusting her own God, whose name and glory is attached to them. In other words, Israel and Judah carries God's name and carries God's glory. They are to shine for God, 
they are to glorify God. But when they turn away from God, God's name and God's glory will be defiled. Well, this is what we see in Israel today, right? 98, 99% of Israel still turn away from God. Number two, if they continue to turn away from their covenant God who promised to be their God to care and protect them, right? If they turn away from their protector, who can they turn to? Well, Judah prefers to use political and military strategies for self-defense their own way. Well, so Judah turned to themselves, right? Isaiah 21, 1 to 10, the doom of turning to Babylon for protection. 11 and 12, the dark silence of Edom to help Judah. 13 to 17, the helplessness of Arabia to defend Judah. So let us read Isaiah 21, uh, verse 1, just verse 1. Uh, I, I'll read this one because I'll show you the map. Here is a prophecy concerning Babylon, the desert by the sea, as whirlwinds rushing in from the southland, an invader comes in from the desert, from a land to be feared. Well, this is a picture that will help explain. Right? You look at Babylon in the center here, right? At the mouth of of uh, the Euphrates, the Euphrates River, right, is the Persian Gulf, right? That is where the sea is, right? And then next to it is the Arabian Desert, right? This is the whole desert, right? Now, Babylon now is described as a land, right, as a desert by the sea. Babylon is not even mentioned as Babylon now, right? God has already won Israel and God is telling, you know what? Israel really is nothing, right? I don't even want, want to mention its name, right? Now, then Isaiah said, now, a terrifying revelation has been given to me. The betrayer betrays. The destroyer destroys. Arise, you Elamites. Lay siege, you meats. I will put an end to all the grief she brought to the nations. The grief Assyria uh, brought to the nations. Right. Babylon is the betrayer that betrayed Judah's trust or the deceiver who deceived Judah of her great power to defend her from the Assyrian Empire. Babylon became the destroyer that destroyed Judah in 586 B.C. Right? B.C. God, the king of all nations, will doubly defeat, defeat Judah and the nation's oppressors, right? God will mobilize the Elamites and Medes with Babylon to attack Assyria. But in 689 BC, Babylon, right, was cruelly demolished by Assyria that Isaiah referred to the horror here in verses 3 and 4. However, 85 years later, right, Babylon revived in 604 as the new Babylonian Empire, it dominated over Assyria. And then God will put an end to all the groaning of the nations from the oppression of Assyria from 701 BC, right, onward, all the way, right, to uh, five, uh, 538. 
Now, in chapter 37, God shows how he's going to put an end to the, to the Assyrian oppression, right? Uh, all right, can someone read for us? Read Isaiah 37 all the way to Isaiah 21 verses 3 and 4. Someone read for us. Isaiah 37, uh, verse 36 to 37, TPT version. That night the angel of Yahweh came into the Assyrian camp and slaughtered uh, 185,000 soldiers. When morning dawned, there were only dead bodies in the enemy's camp. Seen. Yes, Sennacherib, the great king of Assyria, left, returning the same way he came, and retreated to Nineveh, the Assyrian capital. Isaiah 21, uh, verse 3 to 4. There's a churning deep inside me, like labor pains of a woman about to give birth. I'm too anguished by what I heard here and too frightened by what I see. My mind is rearing. I'm filled with panic. I'm long for twilight, but now I tremble through the night. All right. Now, here, Isaiah, right, is pointing. Uh, to something that has not happened yet, right? Isaiah lives in the seven, seven, uh, seven fifties or seven sixties, right? But here is six eighty nine. Now, Isaiah saw, and Isaiah hear what God say, and he is just filled with panic, and and no Isaiah was just like no longing for daylight but he she is trembling through the night of the vision night vision right actually what happened actually what happened later on we're going to see what happened in 689 babylon after nebuchadnezzar during the final days with king belzezzar five 40s BC. Right. Now, Isaiah 21, verse 5 say, I see them prepare the table, spread their rugs, then they eat and they drink. Right. Get up, you military officers, are not your shoes for battle. Right. Now, then the Babylonian destruction by the Medes and Persian. In 538 BC, right now. Okay. Uh, let let's read Isaiah 21, 6 to 9. 6 to 9. Or 6 to 10. Uh, 6 to 10. Okay. Someone read for us. Is that Selena's turn? Can I take can I take that up? I'm, I have a bit of call. Can I take the next one? Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, what about uh Corinne? Corinne, can you read? Mm -hmm. Six All right. All right. Isaiah 21, verse 6, it says uh uh T TPT, yeah? For this is what the Lord said to me. Go. Uh, century and half. It's a bit too small for my reading. Uh. Let me see. A bit small. Mm. Uh, I make it bigger. A bit small, yeah. Go uh, go post a century and have him report what he sees. Seven, 
when he sees them come with chariots and advancing warriors riding on horses, donkeys and camels, let him be alert, extremely alert. By then, the sentry cries out, I continually stand on the watchtower day after day for you. O oh Lord, I am stationed at my post throughout the night. Nine, look, someone's coming. It's a man in a chariot with a team of horses. He shouts, oh, oh he shouts out, fallen, fallen, Babylon has fallen. All the idols of their gods is shattered on the ground. Verse 10. Verse, verse 10. My people lying crushed on the threshing floor, I declare to you what I have heard from the God of Israel, Yahweh, the commander of angel armies. Amen. Amen. Well, this uh, is what God uh, wants Judah. Judah, you are trying to to uh, to make a political alliance with Babylon, right? To protect yourself against Assyria, but look at look at what is going to come. Right now, uh, in terms of uh, the timeline, uh, this is about uh, 750, 650, 550. It's about 200 years later. I uh, know 550, uh, yeah, about 200 years later after the prophecy was given, right? And now that is what happened, right? Babylon is fallen, right? The very nation you depend on to, to, to defend you, they have fallen and their idols lie shattered on the ground. Well, my people, you are lying crushed on the floor now. You are in exile in Babylon now, right? Isaiah say, I just declare what I heard from God, right? Now, so it's a very clear warning, right? That uh, they themselves are in exile, right? And the very nation that, that uh, oppressed them, uh, uh, Babylon, also would be gone one day, right? Now, so let us look at Isaiah 21 verses 11 and 12. Two verses, right? Now, let us read okay. the message. Okay, Isaiah. I'll read that. Yep. I'll read it. <clears throat> uh, here is a prophecy about Duma. Someone keeps calling me from the land of Edom, saying, Watchman, how much longer is the night? Watchman, how much longer is the night? The watchman answers, morning comes, but a dark night endures. If you want to ask again, then come back and ask. Wow. What an encounter, right? <laughs> what an encounter. Well, this is what uh, Isaiah saw, right, in this prophecy, right? And so he reports he just tell I uh, tell Judah what he saw. Well, Duma Duma means silence, right? And Duma is actually a son of Ishmael. Also a town in Judah, but represented by Seir or Edom, right? Declared the certainty of God's plan to destroy the oppressors, right? So the, the watchman in uh, Duma, right, say, you want to know, come back, come back and ask. The night continues to be dark, right? In other words, 
you are asking when is the morning? Yes, the morning will come, but the night will also come. It will follow by the night. The problem continues, right? Day and night, day and night, right? It's so sure it will come, right? Now, let us go to another nation now, right? Isaiah 21, right? 13 to 17, 13 to 17. Okay, I'll read. Okay. This is what the Syrian God said to me. Within exactly one year, and all the splendor of Qadar will end, and all the weapons left by Qadar's warriors will be filled. Read from for verse the thirteen. Read from verse thirteen. Thirteen to oh. seventeen. Yeah. Uh, thirteen. A prophecy concerning Arabia. You caravans from the Dan, you will camp among the thickets in the desert land of Arabia. People of Tema. Come and bring water to the thirsty and bread for the fugitives, for they have fled from the battle, from the drawn swords, from the bent bows, and from the weight of warfare. Isaiah 21, 16. This is what the sovereign God said to me. Within exactly one year, all the splendor of Qadar will end, and all the weapons left of Qadar's warriors will be filled for the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel has spoken. Amen. 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 Here, Judah is asked to look at Arabia now, further away from Judah. And what happened, right, in this place, right, now? Uh, the uh, the Didanites, right, and Kera are the northern tribes of Arabia at Dima, an oasis city, providing the escapees of war, food and water, but it's all insufficient, right? Because in 703, Assyria subdued Arabia, right? And without God, under God's judgment for self-dependence, God say it all ends in destruction. Right. So, what is the message to Judah? Judah say, not just you, Judah, but any nation, right? They try to depend on one another. They don't have what it takes to help one another, to defend against Assyria, right? And God say, look at Arabia, so far away, right? They will be destroyed too. All right, now we're going to go into a longer passage. 22, 1 to 14. The unforgivable sin of Judah. Unrepentant. Foolish in own wisdom. After God spoke to Judah, Judah continued to rebel against God, her covenant king. Totally ignore God. Well, that is unforgivable. Right? Isaiah 22, all the way, 1 to 14. 1 to 14. Right? Who's next? Jennifer, would you, would you like to read? Okay, I'll read. Isaiah 22, verses 1 to 4, TPT. Okay, now back. <laughs> Can you see A that? prophecy con Yes. A prophecy concerning the Valley of Vision. What's happening with you? Why have you all gone up to the rooftops? The whole city is in an uproar. What's happened to the once happy, bustling city? The bodies of the slain litter your streets. They were not slain by the sword on the battlefield, but executed. All your leaders have fled far away, and those who were found were taken captive before they even shot a single arrow. That is why I said, 
Leave me alone to weep my bitter tears. Don't even try to comfort me concerning my beloved people being destroyed. Isaiah 22 verses 5 to 7. The Lord Yahweh, commander of angel armies, has a day in store, a day of tumult, trampling and terror in the valley of vision. It is a day when they breach the walls and the people cry out to the mountain of holiness. The soldiers of Elam attacked with chariots and cavalry, armed with bows and arrows. The troops of Kerr advanced with shields ready. Your lush valleys were full of chariots and the horsemen took their stand at your gates. Isaiah 22 verses 8 to 11. He removed his protection from Judah. In that day, you looked for additional weapons from the storehouses of the forests of Lebanon. You discovered the many breaches in the city of David, and you collected water in the lower pool. You inspected the houses in Jerusalem and tore some down to fortify the wall. You built a reservoir between the two walls in the city to conserve water flowing down from the old pool, but you gave no thought to the one who made it. You did not trust in the one who formed it long ago. 12 to 14. Isaiah 22, 12 to 14. In that day, the Lord Yahweh, commander of angel armies, called you to repent with weeping and mourning and to show your remorse by shaving your heads and wearing sackcloth. But instead, you celebrated with joy and festivity, slaughtering the sheep and the fatted ox, saying, we will feast on meat and drink much wine. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Revealed in my ears are the words of the Lord Yahweh, commander of angel armies. Until your dying day, certainly I will not forgive this sin. Amen. Now, here uh, we have an Israel, um, right, in the Valley of Vision, right? Now, this is amazing, right? Because... Israel, even though they are so far from God, right? God still gives them gifts of seeing in the spirit, right? And Isaiah is one of them. He saw all this. And that is why he's asking, what is happening with you? Right? And uh, all that. Uh, and he said, the body of the slain is everywhere and they are not killed in the battle. They are executed, right? And, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, the prophet say, leave me alone to weep my bitter tears. Don't even try to comfort me concerning my beloved people being destroyed. Here is... Uh, a prophet, right? So overwhelmed by the stubbornness uh, of his people, still do not want to repent after all these warnings, right? Now, in five to seven, I God showed them that in it is a day you now when. The enemy breached the wall and the people cry out uh, to the mountain of holiness, right? Now, they, they cry to God. They cry to God. But what happened next, right? With the valley of Israel full of chariots of the enemy, right? God say, I already removed my protection from Judah, right? And, uh, and, and then Israel and Judah discover the many breaches in the city of David and you collected water in the lower pool. And then you, uh, you, you, you try to find ways to survive, right? Uh, to conserve water and all that. But in all the 
problem and crisis and busyness, what happened? Judah gave no thoughts to the one who made it. Judah did not trust in the one who formed it long ago, right? That is how far gone Judah is. Remember, Judah, right? Children of Abraham has this covenant, has a temple that they worship, has the word of God in the Torah that they read. And uh, when they were children, they all memorize it. But why? Why is it that they, they are not even thinking about God anymore? Why is it when crisis come, they are so confused and they are so lost, right? God said to them again, uh, God called Israel, Judah, repent with weeping and mourning for all the sins you have, you, you have uh, done, for ignoring your God, for dishonoring your covenant, right? Repent, come back, right? Show your remorse uh, by shaving and uh, wearing sackcloth. What happened? What happened? Instead, Israel, Judah, right? Went the opposite way, right? They say, eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Well, what kind of mindset, what kind of faith, what kind of people of God is that, right? And in verse 14, God say, until your dying day, I will not forgive this sin, right? Because you continue uh, to turn away from me, right? That is the picture, right? Now, now we go from verse 15, uh, verse 15 to the end of 25, right? 15 to 25. Let us read. Uh, okay, read 15 to 19 first. 15 to 19. All right, who's turn now? Oh, okay. Cindy, you haven't yeah, read? Yeah, I read. Yet. Sorry, I'm late huh? because just came back from dinner, have a dinner tonight. Okay, Isaiah 22, uh, 15 to 19. This is what the Lord Yahweh, the commander of angel Amis, has to say. Go to Shana, the treasurer of the palace, and say to him, what right do you have to be here? And who give you permission? And why do you chisel out a tomb for yourself here, carving out your royal burial place, a dwelling place in the rock? Watch out, O oh strong man, for the Lord is about to seize you and hurt you down. He will sling you around and around and throw you like a boar into a distant, barren land. There you will die, and all your splendid uh, cherubs will lie there, lie there in the <coughs> dust. You are a disgrace to your master's house. We'll kick you out of office and pull you down from your high position. All right. Here, yeah. right, in the midst of all this, right, that you know, they can't even be bothered to hear uh, God's voice, God's warning, right? Mm. Now, in chapter 22, the second part, right, we have an example of very important people in Israel, right? Leaders of Judah. In fact, the treasurer of the palace, right? What is he doing? Mm. He is just full of pride, full of self uh, about, well, his important position, right? But God warned him, right? God warned him. And God say. You are a disgrace to your master's house. Actually, who is the master here? Right? Actually, the master, rightly speaking, is King David. Oh. It is David's palace, right? Hmm. Down a few generations now. But you no, know, he's still 
uh, responsible for David's palace, but all he's thinking of is himself, right? So proud. And God mm. say, I am a God who can kick you out of, of office and pull you down from high position. God promotes and God can demote as well. Right now, and and let's see who will God promote. Right, Queen. God will find a person and a He's door here. for His plan and purpose to honor God, the King, to be accomplished. Right, someone read for us twenty to twenty five. I read past the uh, Reverend. Okay. On that day, I will appoint my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, to take your place. I will honor him by clothing him with your robe and binding your priestly shafts upon him. I will transfer your authority into his hands, and he will be a father to those living in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place upon his shoulders the keys the key to the treasures the, the treasures of David palace he will open those that no one will shut and he will shut those that no one can open i will strike a blow to him as a nail in a secure place and he will be a glorious throne of honor for his father's house all the glory of his fathers House they will fasten to him, including offspring and branches that will trust in him. Every vessels, jar and bowl, will uh, both small and great, will be fastened to him. And in that day declares the Lord Yahweh, commander of angel armies, the nail fastened in a secure place will give way and be cut off and fall. And all the Lord hanging on it will fall off. The Lord Yahweh has spoken. Amen. Wow. Now, God promotes a priest called Eliakim, right? And uh, and transfer you know, the authority of this uh, Shep, Shepna, right? The treasurer to him. So this priest uh, become a treasurer, right? And then uh, God will place upon his shoulder the key to the treasures of David's palace, right? Now, who can actually promote a priest to be a treasurer except God, right? So God opened the door, no one can shut. God shut the door, no one can open, right? Not even the king, right? It's God himself will appoint. Verse 23 is a very interesting picture, right? Now, it is a picture of, uh, of faithfulness, right? What happened when a slave uh, is bought and uh, a slave comes to the house. You know, the owner, right, would use a nail to pierce through his ear and nail it to the house, right, and nail it to the door, right, and uh, and and that is that is the, the symbol of the slave uh, belonging to the house, serving the family, and be faithful, right? Now, here, Eliakim, right, is uh, chosen by God to be a faithful servant, right, and uh, be a... Uh, but bring honor and glory uh, to uh, David's house. 
you look at this, all the glory of his father's house, they will fasten to him, including offspring and branches that will trust in him. Right now, this is the, uh, the spiritual lesson that we um, need to learn again and again. The moment we become a Christian, the moment we belong to God, imagine this picture that God take our ear and nail and nail through our ear, right, to a very, very important place, a secure place, right, to show that we belong to him and we will honor him. Now, the idea is that as a servant, all the glory of God, all the glory of, of the kingdom will be fastened to him, right? Including offspring and branches, right? Now, as a Christian today, do we see that all the glory of God is fastened to us? The name, the reputation, the goodness, and the truth, and the grace, and the love, and the peace of God fastened to us, right? We hold, we carry, we represent God in all his glory. Do we see it like that about ourselves as a Christian? as God's child, right? The devil wants us to know that we are not glorious. We are terrible. We are failures and all that. But in God's own plan, right? All the glory of God is nailed to us, is fastened to us. We really have to take verse 24, right? God's promise, God's word, and, and, and say, Lord, I want to be like this. Mm. Help me, Father. Let your glory be fastened to my life, right? Amen. And that God himself would listen to this prayer. God himself will be so glad that you want his glory to be fastened to you because you are a child of God, right? So everything will be fastened, right? Now, and there will be a, uh, there'll be a day when the nail will give way and be cut off and fall. And all the load hanging on it will fall off, right? Now, this is to say to us that as much as we want to have the glory of God, right? It will end if we depend on ourselves. If we carry the weight ourselves. On that day, the glory will be gone. Now, that is what happened to many, many, many Christians, right? Even the very anointed Christians, right? Even Christians who met with God and experienced God. But somehow, one day, that experience is gone, right? Well, God has said it. Well, what is God warning God is saying that don't depend on yourself to carry the glory. You cannot carry the my glory by yourself. You cannot carry my honor and my, my uh, authority and my power and my peace and my wisdom by yourself. You need me. You need to ask me to help all the time. Right? So that is the lesson. So in chapter 22, 
we have a very big contrast. We have a servant that is so unfaithful, so self-centered, and um, God will kick him out and pull him down from high position. Then we have another servant, right, that God will mightily use to carry all his glory, and yet being won not to carry with his own strength. Okay, now we got come to the last uh, third chapter, right? Isaiah 23, 1 to 7. This is the destruction of a godless nation, the nation of Tyre and Sidon, right? Isaiah 23, 1 to 7. Could someone read, please? All right, Kareem, uh, Connie, yeah, would you like to read? Isaiah 22. Okay, I shall read. Isaiah 23, a prophecy for Tyre and Sidon. Well, you cargo ships of Tashish for Tyra, your port city has fallen without a house or a harbor. Word has come to them from the land of Cyprus. Be silent, you inhabitants of the coast and you merchants of Sidon, once thronged by seafarers. On the great waters, your revenue was the grain from the Nile Basin, the harvest of the Nile was your revenue. You were merchants who traded with the nations. Sidon, be ashamed, as I have never gone into labor to give birth to children, nor have I raised up sons or daughters. When the Egyptians hear it, they will be stunned over the destruction of Tyra, cross over to Tashish, will you inhabitants of the coast. Is this your once boisterous city founded so long ago? Is this the city that once sent settlers over the sea? Okay. Can I ask you to Isaiah read? 23, verse 8 to 15. Okay. Can you read out verses 1 to 7 again? Uh, okay. Read slowly. Read it again. <laughs> okay. A prophecy for Tyra and Sidon. Whale, you cargo ships of Tashish. For Tyra, your port city has fallen without a house or a harbour. Word has come to them from the land of Cyrus. Verse 2, be silent, you inhabitants of the coast, and you merchants of Sidon, once thronged by seafarers. On the great waters, your revenue was the grain from the Nile Basin. The harvest of the Nile was your revenue. You were merchants who traded with the nations. Verse 4, Sidon, be ashamed for the sea, the stronghold of the sea declares, I have never gone into labor to give birth to children, nor have I raised up sons or daughters. Five, when the Egyptians hear it, they will be stunned over the destruction of Tyra. Cross over to Tashish. Will you inhabitants of the coast? Seven, is this your once boisterous city founded so long ago? Is this the city that once sent 
settlers over the sea. Okay. Isaiah 23. Right. We, we just look at 1 to 7. Uh, right. Tyre, right, uh, is going to be humbled by God. Right. No, Tyre and Sidon, they are very, very busy seaport, like maybe Singapore and Hong Kong, right? And uh, they earn a lot of money from the grain of Nile from Egypt, right? And uh, and you no, know, they they are merchants. They they have international trade. Now, God said in this prophecy, sit and be ashamed for the sea, the stronghold of the sea. I have never gone into labor to give birth to children, nor have I raised up sons and daughters, right? Here, the people of the sea, right, uh, is getting a rebuke from the sea, right? He said, uh, from you, out of Sidon, right? I have not birthed, I have not produced, right? Uh, children, right? Uh, why is that? Why, why, what is the, uh, uh, the purpose of this rebuke, right? Now, the, uh, the port cities, right? Are filled with all these uh, sailors, right? And and uh, no, the ports, right, are owned by all these rich people uh, who make all this trade, right? That is all they know. That is all they want, and that is what all they glory in, right? And what about their children? Who looks after their children? Well, as we know, that when people are so, uh, so often in the sea, they are like, out of one year, they might be uh, seven months, nine months in the sea. When do they see their children? When they come back, they go to unload, they go to calculate, they got to count their money. When do they see their children? Right? They have not raised their children. Right? This is the problem of being so busy, right? Uh, in business, right? Now let us read 8 to 14. 8 to 14. Another person read for us. Uh, okay. Tato, can you read this? <laughs> Eva read lah, Eva. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eva. <laughs> uh, who has planned this for Imperial Tire? Who who once wore her crown? Your merchants were nobles, and your traders were honored by the world. Yahweh, the commander of angel armies, has planned it. His plan is to eliminate the pride of your presumed splendor and to humiliate the honor of the world. Daughter Tasha, cross over your land as one crosses the Nile, for there is no more harbor marketplace. Yahweh has stretched out his hand over the seas of humanity and has shaken the kingdoms of this world. He has given his command to destroy Phoenicia fortresses. He said, Fair Sidon, the oppressed one, your celebrating is over. Rise and cross over to Cyprus. Even there you will find no rest. Right. Here, uh, God say, you know, uh, you are so strong in your trading, 
right? You are so good at your at your shipping uh, uh, system. Uh, the world honors you, right? But God say, I have a plan. I have a plan that will uh, humble you, right? And humiliate the honor of the world. Now, what, what is it that God is uh, doing here, right? God is saying that, uh, like the world today, so caught up in business, so caught up that, you know, human relationships, right, even in the family is no longer, right, the priority, right? So, verse 10, God is saying, daughter of Tashis, children of the Tashis, well, go somewhere else, right? Uh, because I'm going to destroy this place, right? And there'll be no more marketplace. Verse 11 is what we need to take home and pray today. Yahweh has stretched out his hand over the sea of humanity and has shaken the kingdoms of this world. He has given his command to destroy the fortresses, right? And uh, he said, you will find no rest, right? Today, the same Yahweh is still stretching out his hand over the sea of humanity, right? The same Yahweh is shaking the kingdoms of the world about very important issues of relationship with your own family and indirectly telling this nation that does not know God that you have it, you don't even have time for me, right? Even if you go and uh, find somewhere else, uh, after I, I, I destroy this place, you will find no rest because you do not know me. You don't have a relationship with me. And so this is a, a very important, uh, important uh, picture uh, for today's world. Now we're going to read the next section, just one, uh, two, two verses. And then read something that I've clipped from AI, from artificial intelligence, right? Now, we read verse 13 and 14. Someone read for us. Anyone? Verse 13. Behold the land of the Babylonians. They are a people who have lost their identity. The Assyrians have made her a home for wild animals. They erected sea towers against her, demolished her palace, and made her a heap of ruins. Well, your merchant ship of Tashis for you your fortress is destroyed okay now first of all verse 13 talk about uh the babylonian empire right destroyed right by the assyrians now this is way before right now, that's why I go to uh, artificial intelligence and ask, what happened, right, to Babylon, right, in this verse? And this is what the artificial intelligence uh, report, uh, you, you see this. If you use AI, right, to do research, Right, you begin to find all oh, this very helpful, right? Of course, 
uh, you need to know yourself uh, something so that you not you not be uh, led astray by the computer right now the computer is very good very helpful but the computer is not god and the computer um does not know uh whether though it is fully right or not right but anyhow this one is very very good right so i'm going to ask someone to read for us right uh, about uh babylonian destruction in 600 and 89 BC by Assyria, right? Someone read for us. Can I read for that? Can I read? Yes, please. In 689 BCE, Babylon experienced a catastrophic event. It was destroyed by the Assyrian Sh Shana Sarib. This destruction was a significant moment in ancient Near East, Near East, Near, East, Near Eastern history. Are the key points one? Assyrian conquest, Sena, I uh, can pronounce this, Sena Sarib, the king of Assyria, led a military campaign against Babylon. He to complete destruction. Sena Sarib not only conquered Babylon, but went to extraordinary lengths to destroy it. He ordered the city to be thoroughly demolished. Three, flooding. After looting and destroying the city, Sena Sarib had the Euphrates River diverted to flood the ruins further obliterating what remained of Babylon. Religious significance. The destruction included the desecration of Babylon's temple and religious, religious sites, which was seen as a grave sacrilege by many, including some Assyrians. Five, political context. This extreme action was Sennacherib's response to ongoing rebellions in Babylon against Assyrian rule. Six, historical impact. The destruction of Babylon in 689 BCE was remembered as a shocking and traumatic event in Mesopotamian history. This event is particularly notable because Babylon was an ancient and revered city, considered the culture, the center of culture and learning in the ancient world. Its destruction was seen as an act of extreme brutality, given even by the standards of ancient warfare. Interestingly, Babylon was later be built, rebuilt, and would eventually rise to become the dominant power in the region, conquering Assyria up about 80 years later. This resurgence culminated in the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which would eventually conquer Judah in 586 BC. Wow. Amen. Do you like this research? <laughs> well, uh, the AI can help you to get uh, this uh, kind of his history. So what the AI does is that um, they have got documents from ancient Near Eastern history, right? And they got the Bible, right? And then they, they compare the two and they give you this summary, right? And this is very important for us to understand the background uh, of this passage. Behold, the land of Babylonians, they are a people who have lost their identity, right? How can Babylon lost their identity? No, we, we hear even about the seven wonders of the world, about the hanging garden of Babylon and all that. I know even for us here in Malaysia, in our school, we, we read about that, right? Now, how can Babylon uh, lose her identity, right? It's because of this war, right? This war uh, is really very, very terrible, right? Isaiah saw it and Isaiah was horrified by it because of the cruelty, right? The cruelty of this war. Now, one of the things that uh, is marked in history is that, you know, um, the Assyrians diverted, right, the Euphrates River, right, to flood the city of Babylon, 
well, that is like never done before, right? And that, that must have taken a lot of a lot of work, right? To divert the river. And the river flooded the city, right? Now, God say one day, the river Euphrates will dry up. And you know what happened? It is drying up now. Some part of the river is completely dry now. Miraculous is a very big river, right? And now they discover, right, the city that was buried under the flooded river, right? That Sinatra has uh, has caused, right, uh, on, on Babylon. Now, This passage is very important to us because the drying up of Euphrates is a sign of Jesus' return again, right? So another sign is already accomplished. How soon do you think Jesus will return, right? All we can say is, it is very soon now, very soon now, right? All this uh, message we have read so far, right, tells us that the world we lived in, right, is not safe, right? And that the world we lived in have so many, so many enemies of God, right, trying to pull us away from God, make us so busy, we destroy relationship in a family, we destroy society. Once the family relationship is destroyed, civilization after civilization will fall, right? That is how, uh, when there is no love in the family, right? They give birth to what? They give birth to homosexuals. They give birth to lesbians. They give birth to all these strange things in society, right? Now, that society will fall. Just like America now, right? America will fall, except that in America, God still have 7,000 who have not bowed down to the, to the idols of this world, right? And we are praying, and these 7,000 in America are praying day and night for the salvation of America now, right? Now, let us look at the last section, right? Uh, Isaiah 23, 15 to 18. Let us read this. Someone read for us. I read Raymond Cook. Yes. Isaiah 23, verse 15. In that day, Tyre will remember Remain forgotten for 70 years. Equal to the life spent of a king. After 70 years, it will happen to tie as the song about the prostitute. Take a harp and go about the city. You prostitute, long forgotten. May your sweet melody and sing many songs so that you will be remembered again. At the end of 70 years, the Lord Yahweh will restore to you, but she will return to her trade. She will prostitute herself again with every kingdom of the world, but her merchandise and earnings will be set apart as holy to the Lord Yahweh. They will neither be stored nor hoarded, but they will supply abundant food and splendid garments for those who live in the presence of the Lord Yahweh. Amen. Amen. Well, here, Haya, right, will be forgotten for 70 years. Well, mm. because of what we read in the last section, God will destroy it, right? God will destroy it. But after 70 years, right, after 70 years, God will restore her. But 
the sad thing is, right, she'll return to her trade. She'll return to business as usual. She'll return to all the selling and all that and prostitute herself with every kingdom of the world, right? Now, this is a very, very strange and a very, very sad picture about a nation and about people, right? Who prostitute themselves. In other words, they have no regard for their own dignity and they sell their own heart. They sell their own life, right? Away. No value, right? God is saying that I have not forgotten you. You may be forgotten, but I will restore you, right? And what's more is that God would use Tyre with all the wealth and the earning and the merchandise, right, to offer to God, right? They will be used for kingdom, right, purpose. Tyre of the world gave her heart to the world, but God will woo her back to return all the wealth for godly, righteous kingdom purposes. God is truly king of the nations. At the end of this second series of uh, warning, that is good news, right? That God, the king of nations, will not forget nations, will not forget Malaysia, will not forget the nations of the world, God will draw at least a remnant as a, as a percentage of that country back to himself. And we see that. We see that almost in every nation, right? A small group uh, compared to the population of the nation have come to come back to God. Like in China, 10% of China's 1.5 billion, right? 150, yeah, 150 million, right? In China have turned to God, right? Malaysia, how many percent, right? Israel really turned to God, 0.2 uh, percent, right? The rest of the, the Israel statistic of 2 percent belongs to the Palestinians, belongs to other, other tribes, not Jews, right? In other words, 1.8 percent belong to uh, the non-Israelites. Out of the 2 percent, right, that is called a uh, Christian. What about Japan? Japan uh, is still around below 1%. What about Taiwan? Taiwan used to be below 1%, but now Taiwan is slowly becoming 2, 3, 4% now. Thailand, even more, right? less than 1%, less than half percent. Now, the revival in Thailand right, is bringing the number up right, to maybe 1%, maybe 2% of the whole nation, right, of 70, 80, 90 thousand million people, right. Now, so in the rest of the world, right, uh, God is doing that. God is doing that. Our question must be, what about the 90% of Chinese people in China? What about the 99% of Japanese? What about the 97% of Taiwanese? 
What about the 98% of Thais or Cambodia or whatever, Vietnam, Laos, right? Or Burma, right? Now, God is saying to us, The example of, of Tyre and Sidon tells us, don't forget God. Don't be so busy with the world and become a prostitute to the world and give our heart to the world and no longer to God. We will be lost, right? Or like Arabia, right? They got resources, but not enough, right? They cannot help. And in the end, they get conquered, right? Now, God is using the nations of the world to warn not just Judah, but all nations on earth now, right? So let us use these passages to pray for Malaysia, right? To pray for nations of the world. Some of you may have heard that recently, right? the Kinabalu House of Prayer have started, right? And uh, now we are finding people who somehow heard about the Kinabalu House of Prayer in uh, the Hallelujah uh, Retreat Center, right? Just very close to the National Park. It's now open, open for people to go and worship and pray. Well, praise God. People from different places have come uh, and uh, go up to the mountain to pray. I want to encourage those in Sabah and those outside Sabah, right? To actually make our way there, right? Go up to the mountain and pray. There is a, there is a place that, we, that, that uh, is open. You can go in. There is a guitar, there is a drum, there is whatever worship instrument, and uh, there's a quietness of the Mount Kinabalu, right? To pray and to reclaim Mount Kinabalu uh, as God's mountain, for God to rule from Mount Kinabalu, for God to send his angels to fight the good fight against the robbers of Saba the robbers of uh, Mount Kinabalu, right? And to restore, right, the blessings of God in revival, right? In wealth, in every way, right? And um, well, so this is an example, right? And so um, let us remember how God really won us back to himself. He's longing for us. Right? Now, some of us here say, oh, but I heard about this long time ago, but my life is a little bit boring now, and I don't feel the, you know, the, the life of God in me. What do I do? Right? So I want to encourage you, right? Uh, look for this book, right? Read the testimony of this book. And uh, see how God would bless you. Amen. Um, this book. Uh, let me get the, the copy and show you the cover.
Reverend Ku, is it the transforming power of heaven? Is it that one? I think that one because I tried to open the, the website, come out that book. Is the one, eh? I have just posted if that is correct. Uh, yeah, the transforming power of heaven. Yeah. I think he only got one book, right? <laughs> I don't know. I just posted if that is correct. Not sure. Where can we get this book? Google. Uh, is it Amazon? I'm not too sure. King Kindle. Where I check uh. Kindle copy. Amazon. I think you can go to Amazon. Yeah, but this is Kindle edition. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now. This is the the, the book. Yeah. Uh, Transform wow. Power of Heaven. Right. Mm. By uh Ellen Martha. Right. Now it's a wonderful book, right? And uh let us give thanks. Father, we just thank you for oh. this bread that is broken for us and for this wine that represent your sinless blood for us. Lord, you have done everything needed for us to come back to God, for us to really hunger and be close to you, Father. Lord, we receive now for cleansing, for repentance, for forgiveness to be restored to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise God. Um, Anybody like to share or ask or? Raven Cole, just the, where, where can we find this book or can we get this book? <laughs> this power. Huh? Have you got the notes for today? I haven't read yet. <laughs> I haven't opened the link yet. Uh, I, 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 I think I, I, uh, I see the link. It's, it's see in a to WhatsApp, right? Oh. You can use the WhatsApp link to get okay. it in Amazon. Amazon. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So right. American dollar is about $8. So convert to Malaysia uh, is about 40 ringgit. Okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it's very worth it. Mm. So like you mentioned the prayer mountain, the praise, right? Mm. At least you said there will be a kita and all these are uh, as for, for those uh, visit, uh, go there to worship. I think this one we have to go in a group, correct? Uh, in a group. Mm -hmm. mm. Um. We, we we need each other. Yeah. Right? Come together as a group. Meet each mm. other. Right? Mm. And then um yeah, it'll be helpful. Mm. Yeah. Actually, even on Sunday night, 
no, if you can meet even two or three, right, that would also help. And then mm. we can uh, have a small group kind of uh, uh, learning and sharing and playing together. Mm. Mm. But we arrange ourselves, lah, oh? Organize. Yeah. Okay. Thank well, you, Raven. Have to right. leave. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, good night. Thank you very Good much. Uh,